anti-apartheid activist, mother, daughter, wife, a legal rock star. Some have even called her a world-class troublemaker. I'm here at the Durban home of Dr. Navi Pillay, the former United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights. Let's find out more about her. South Africa was not an easy place for young black women. Racial segregation was a stark reality of everyday life, while access to education, let alone quality education, was a far-fetched dream. Nirvana Tempele was born on the 23rd of September 1941 in the poor community of Clarewood in the then Natal province. Pele refused to be defined by her circumstances and found ways under, around or through the carefully constructed socio-economic restrictions of apartheid South Africa. The little girl from Clarewood would box her way to many firsts. And then on your and channel, you know, twice I was on the front page of the New York Times. In 1967, she became the first black woman to open her own law practice in Natal. In 1973, she fought and won the right for political prisoners to have access to legal counsel. In 1988, she became the first South African to obtain a Doctor of Judicial Sciences degree from the prestigious Harvard University. In 1995, she would become the first black female judge of the South African High Court. In that same year, she was elected by the United Nations to be a judge on the Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda where for the first four years, she was the only woman to serve on that panel. She later became the president of that committee. Her tenure at the Rwanda Tribunal is best remembered for her role in the landmark trial that helped establish that rape and sexual assault constitute an act of genocide. In 2008, Pele was nominated by the then United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for the position of High Commissioner for Human Rights a position she held until her retirement in 2014. And a tragic failure for the cause of human rights. I want us to go back to the beginning, if we can. Think about yourself as a little girl growing up in Clarewood, here in Durban. What was expected of little girls or young teenage girls during that time? We're talking about 1940s, early 1950s here in Durban. Firstly, girls were not expected to get any education. So my mother stood in long lines to get us places in school. So there were more girls than places at school. So that was one challenge. The other is you were very poor. And so I applied for free books because my father was a bus driver and I was granted the free books, but one of the teachers who lived close by in rented accommodation was very offended. She said, you live in a big house, and so I'm going to cancel these free books. So there wasn't that spirit of encouraging children and so on. It was all these small town prejudices that put you down. So poverty and the prejudice against girls certainly affected us mm. at school. And also we all were segregated. So there, there were Indian schools, colored schools, African schools, barely visible, of course. Yet we all lived together. But looking at yourself as a little girl growing up and what was expected of you, especially from an education point of view, your parents were different in their approach, wasn't it? You were one of seven children, number four. Yes. I believe your parents were of Tamil descent. Your father was a bus driver. And here comes this whippersnapper who loves books, wants to read. What was your parents' approach to you? Well, my father made it clear that he would treat all his children equally. And whoever wanted to go on to school and study, he would encourage. He had no money, yet he stood on that principle. And the first one to go to high school was in my family was my older sister. She was two years older than me, ended up as a school principal. And so my father asked his boss for leave to take my sister to high school. And the, his boss said, oh, what do you want to do all that for? You know, it's enough. She's had primary education. But he was sending his own children, obviously. 
And my father said, look, when it comes to work, you can tell me what to do. But when it comes to bringing up my children, you can't tell me what to do. And then we had another rich aunt on my mother's side who discouraged my parents from sending us to high school because they said they'll get spoiled. And, you know, other members of the family uh, criticized this education of girls. I remember they used the word, you know, why are you pickling your daughters instead of, instead of marrying them off? So you're right. I think as I look now, we had parents who truly loved their children and wanted to give us that opportunity. So actually, I got to high school because I had an award from the primary school, so all that helped. Mm -hmm. I got to university on bursaries, and because the community of Clarewood, also a very poor mm -hmm. community, all collected their pennies uh, at the request of the school, the principal and the teachers went door to door and said, we have a girl with potential. We think she should go to university. And that's how I went. The first girl, Indian girl in that community to go to university. Did you feel a great debt of gratitude to that community? I deeply did. You know, and I, I went to visit them all at a community function recently and repeated all this. And of course, as soon as I became a lawyer, I made sure I put more than enough money into that mm -hmm. fund so that the next child can get mm -hmm. educated. And so at this big community event, I thanked them. I mm -hmm. said, I want you to know the trust you placed in me. These are the things I've done outside the world. At what age do you think you realized that not all human beings were being treated equally around you? When you listen to your conversation, of your, that's your first source of education. You find that your parents are being insulted, treated badly and rudely and discriminated. And you respect, you know, I respected my father and he was saying how he was treated like a boy by white police. And then the uh, blackjacks that used to come around and raid backyards, now that was so inhuman. So I always said to people outside the country that every child growing up under apartheid soon became aware of unfair discrimination and racism. At what point then did you decide that law was going to become your life's pursuit? Well, I don't know if you know, but I was uh, preschool, so I was under six, when my mother had given me money to take to my father. As his bus came around, this man who was the former conductor on my father's bus mm -hmm. wrenched the money out of my hand and he ran off. And so there was a court case, and I had to give evidence in that court case. How old were you at the time? Five, yeah, five plus. I spoke in Tamil. I recall vividly uh, that I, they put a stool for me to stand on in the witness box, mm -hmm. where years later I was not only a lawyer in that courtroom, be in the high court, but also a judge in that same court. So anyway, on that occasion, he was found guilty, of course, but I was really saddened that my father was not getting his money back. And I said to him, well, what kind of justice is that? Mm. He was holding my hand as we walked away from the court, and he said, the money doesn't matter. It's his whole month's salary. Yeah, the money doesn't matter. I'm so proud that my child spoke up in court today. So I think the injustice builds in you. And I realize that to survive in South Africa, you have to know the law. You have to know your rights. We seem to have no rights then. And on top of that, we all cooperated under apartheid. You know, we didn't do what young people are doing today. Well, of course, because the threat of danger, of being killed, was ever present. But you knew you'd be expelled from school, your parents will lose their jobs, the teachers will lose their jobs if they even discussed political matters. So children were very sensitive to this as well. So you go to university and you're now going to study law. But even that was difficult in the way that the classes were set up. I read yeah. somewhere that you would sit and to fill the time, read up on the Nuremberg cases. And I was wondering what that must have been like to be reading those details while all of 
South African history and, and what life was like at the time was unfolding around you? Yes, no, that's a great question. Firstly, the uh, law courses were scheduled to suit the white male students who were serving articles. So it was seven and eight in the morning mm -hmm. and seven and eight at night. So that's why I had this whole day. Couldn't go back home because I only had bus fare mm -hmm. for one round trip. I found this stack of volumes in a dusty corner. I don't think anyone else knew they were there. And I read them. I was just a, a young law student. I couldn't have understood everything, but I was very keen to know about the prosecution of people in leadership, mm -hmm. political leaders, military leaders, and judges who were put on trial. In my mind, I related that to all the very live apartheid under which we were struggling. So it wasn't an academic reading. Mm -hmm. It's you moved by what you're seeing around you, knowing that uh, we, we seem to be so helpless. But I was very keen to know about justice and accountability. And did that allow you to see almost a light at the end of the tunnel? That what had happened there and it had culminated in the Nuremberg cases, that perhaps in South Africa, through the work, through the law, and anti-apartheid struggle, that there could be a light at the end of the tunnel. Precisely. That's why I read them, and I was convinced in terms of the legal arguments, that was the international law that, that they were applying, that there are certain universal, not only under common law, we didn't have a constitution then, but the common law in South Africa supported accountability and justice and revealed to me that apartheid was wrong in terms of those universal laws. They said there's no way they will have a situation where a white secretary has to take instructions from a black person. Thank you.